Welcome back to our study in the book of Romans. This is Sonship Orientation, and this is going to be session six. I want to just make a statement here at the first that will carry in something we were talking about here at the break. And that is, in fact, I've, I've talked about that twice at the break. Once with, who are you people and what are you doing here? I, I just suddenly drew a blank. <laughs> who was I talking to? Susie. That's who it was. You weren't going to help me out at all, were you? Oh, that is so like her. No, well, you know, too late. Susie, 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 Susie. Okay, anyway, we're talking about, even though we haven't completed that first appellative of sonship, being a simple son, you have to understand that even if through some catastrophe, because we're talking about Doc, really wanting to get this thing, you know, but right now where you all are, you know what we're doing. You, you, we haven't done it, but you know what we're doing. And you have already said, yes, I'm, I'm going to get that because you're still showing up. Believe me, if, this is, if you don't want it and this is what you chose to do for these two hours, God bless you. All right? But if, if a plane crashed into this building... And, and killed us all. You say, man, we didn't even become a simple son. What is going to happen? You're going to be ahead of about 95.5% of everybody that's ever trusted Jesus to be their Savior. Because, you know why? By simple virtue of the fact that you, ha you know what it is, and you've said, I want that. Because 95% of folks who are saved have never said yes to sonship. And so you've, I mean, so I'm not saying you should quit now. <laughs> like, okay, I got it made. But, but I am saying that the simple fact that you have already made that kind of a decision in your own heart means something to your father. Okay, now with that said, I, I want to pick up where we left off. And, and bring the law into our conversation just for a moment. Because one of the reasons that you'll never, ever be educated by the law is because the law is the tutor and governor. And as I told you at the end of the last session, tutors and governors can only tell you about the Father, but it's a whole different thing to be educated by the Father, to learn to think not about Him, but with Him. And that's a whole different thing. And that's what he is wanting to do. And even though God is the one that ordained the law and it contains his perfect righteousness, uh, it, it, it cannot teach you how to think like he thinks. And that's the first component of godliness. Um, and so he's going to begin to do that. Now, I want to give you a warning right here at the outset. As we go through the curriculum and you begin to be educated to think like your Heavenly Father thinks, you are going to encounter a number of counterfeits. And every single thing that He wants to put in you, a counterfeit exists for. And... The wisdom of your heavenly Father, there's a, there's, a, there's a number of these, and in your notes you'll get to see these, but there is the wisdom of men, there's the wisdom of this world, and there is the wisdom of the princes of this world, which is the principalities that are up in those governmental places. All three, of, that's just three of those. The wisdom of your father is going to be counterfeited. Remember I told you at the end of the last session, there's not anything you can do in regular doing of your job that will suddenly now qualify you to know exactly how your father thinks about all these things. That's just not going to happen. And what I want to say is, there's a competing wisdom out there. It started in the garden. When Adam was put in the garden, hadn't Satan already rebelled? Evil was already in the universe, wasn't it? And what was the tree that God told Adam not to eat of? Tree of, tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now I know what Bertha, she's thinking, 
they put the cherubims at the gate to keep him from eating of the tree of life after he had eaten of the... I know that's what she was thinking. It's the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Well, wait a minute. Good and evil existed. Don't you think at some point God was going to have to educate Adam about good and evil? That's right. But he was going to do it in his wisdom. What got Adam in trouble was a competing wisdom came along and gave him information about good and evil, but it wasn't given to him in the way that it would produce godliness. That was what the father would have done. Instead, it was given to him in a way that produced ungodliness. The competing wisdoms are going to look very similar to. In fact, sometimes they're going to look like a match to your Heavenly Father's wisdom. I'm going to warn you now, we can't substitute anything for what He is going to teach us. When you look, you may, say, you may look at something and say, and I've done it, you may look at something and say, you know, that sounds an awful lot like, and there'll be something you'll be familiar with, we are going to go through the steps that our Father lays out because at the end you're going to see it's going to contain something that that other wisdom didn't have. So, uh, and, I, and I'm just saying that now because I want that to be in your mind uh, as we begin to go through the curriculum. Now, here's one of the things that you're really going to enjoy. There's a number of things. When you begin to be dealt with as an adopted son, one of the primary good things that happens to you, and this is something you really have to understand, is that you are given great liberty. Let me give you a couple of verses, just so you'll know them. Stand fast, Galatians 5.1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. I almost wish I'd taken that yoke of bondage and highlighted that in there for you because I'm gonna, I'm gonna say something about that in just a moment. In fact, what do you think, if you had to just guess and say, or maybe you know, what is, what do you think the yoke of bondage is? Remember where you're at, you're in Galatians here. If you know what Galatians is about, you pretty well got it identified for you. Yeah, you all knew it, everybody across the room. The yoke of bondage is the law. There are some things the law absolutely binds you to. Before we look at those, let me give you another one in Galatians 5.13. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. That was the problem, by the way, with the Galatians. They were trying, they'd gotten saved by grace, and now they're trying to live for God back under the law. And he's saying, look, stand fast in the liberty. Because what does the law do? Touch not, taste not. Remember all those? He's, in fact, we're going to read that. But, but he's saying, look, you've been given liberty in Christ, and you need to stand fast in that liberty. And, but but look, at the, look what follows here. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Can a person abuse their liberty? Because here is, and you, and you already know this, with the privilege of liberty comes responsibility to use it rightly. And we already know that. We say that to our kids. You want freedoms? Show me some responsibility. And, 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 and it works that way with this as well. Now, let's see. There's some other verses, but before, before I take you to these other verses, I want to just say that when your father takes you and now begins to educate you, and you do have this liberty... When he begins to educate you, you're going to enjoy an intimacy of fellowship with him that is going to go beyond anything that you have ever experienced before. I, and, and I know we've mentioned a few of these things. I don't want to get off on these subjects, but, you know, when we talk about the issues of prayer and those kinds of things, when people say, boy, when I begin to understand how this dispensation is working and what God is doing, Boy, a lot of the things I used to pray for, you know, I find are not the things that, you know, are really happening in this dispensation. But it leads to the question, well, what in the world am I going to pray for? And, of course, I told you until we get over there, and it is in Romans 8, until we get over there, just do what you're doing. Don't worry. Because the wonderful promise is that the Spirit's going to make intercession this time 
according to the will of the Father with groanings that cannot be uttered. Now you don't have to worry, God says don't worry about that. Even when you get to the place where you say, and that's what he says in Romans 8, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. Notice he didn't say we don't know how to pray. He said we don't know what to pray for. Because you're going to look at this and you're going to say, all these things I have been praying for are really not prayer issues they're education issues. I'm praying to know God's will. And we've been taught, I know God's will by going, okay, now God, please show me your will. Okay, now I'm going to flip through the Bible. And, he, and as a kid, I even did Bible roulette. I just opened it up and put my finger on a verse and read, Thy congregation hath dwelt therein. Thou, O God, hast prepared of thy goodness for the poor. And then I try to, Figure out what that means for me. You ever? Do, I don't know if you've ever done that. I've done that. I think God gave me a verse, and He's in He's in heaven, doubled over, you know, because He's going that my poor little ignorant guy. He's going to be bald headed one day too. Just watch. Well, <laughs> the whole idea is we we we're trained up to think that's how we determine God's will. Your father's going to say, the very first thing I'm going to do is to teach you to think like I'm going to think. So that you won't have to pray and ask me, what is your will? You're going to know it. As a matter of fact, let me jump you to Romans 12, just verbally here. You're going to prove what is his will. What does that say over there? I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You're going to prove God's will. You know why? You're going to know it. And you're in your liberty, you're going to make decisions that prove God's will. It's, it's not a, I know you don't look at it this way because you do it with an honest heart. And I've done, look, anything I mention to you, I have done a billion times. I'm not casting stones at anybody. But when I used to pray, God, show me your will, show me your will, I just want to know your will. Show me your will. That was the equivalent of me going in to take m my test in school without studying, saying, God, show me the answers. Show me the answers. And you know what his answer to that is? You should have studied. Because I'm not showing you anything you don't know. Well, on his will, it's going to work the same way. And when you come to that understanding that it's not a prayer issue, it's an education issue. Taking that test wasn't a prayer issue. That's, an edu that's a learn the material issue. You're going to learn. God, and that's why I told you that first decision making skill that he's going to teach you is out of ten right choices, which one brings him the most pleasure? That's his will. And you're going to know it. You, you won't have any doubt about it. You'll never come to me and say, what is God's will for me about this? I want to tell you something better than that. I'm forbidden to tell you. Now that, that will drop a lot of preachers out of sonship, teaching sonship, because they love to tell everybody what God's will is for them. In fact, they want to control what you think and what you do and how you do it. And so they want to tell you what God, I'm going to tell you now, I can't tell you, if you come to me and say, I got two job offers, which one do I take? I mean, I can, I can look at that and go, wow, here's the pluses and minuses on this one, and here's the pluses and minuses on that one. Number one, you have liberty as an adult son. I don't get to tell you what to do. If I do, what have you made me? Tutor and governor. You just, you just got into childhood. You have liberty. You know, I, I tell you, I just thought of ways to illustrate this. And I just, I think, here's all these adults, and they want God to treat them like they're five. God, tell me what, what I do now. What I do now. What I do now. 
And he's thinking, and I'm going to put you to work in my business? Doing what? So, all right, beating a dead horse. I, I, I took, took that further than I meant to take it because I wasn't going to get off on that. It's education issues, not so much prayer issues. But my point was going to be, we get to the place where we say, I don't know what I'm supposed to pray for. And you're supposed to get to that point. And then he's going to teach you about that. And, and my point in all of that was to say, the intimacy of fellowship that you're going to have with your father is going to lead to a greater prayer life than you ever, ever, ever had before. Ever. And you will not be, once you get into it, you'll never be saying, well, you took everything away from me. What am I supposed to pray for now? You'll be thinking, I don't have enough, t I'm talking to him all the time. It, I'm going down the road talking. I, I'm going to bed talking. By the way, you will be going to bed talking. You are going to go to bed talking. I'm telling you now, you are. And you're going to talk to him. Direct, and it's not going to be like, you, like it was before. And, and, it's going, and it's going to be about different things. We talked about, I do know that it was last Tuesday I talked about this. You know what 98% about, I'm guessing, but 90, certainly in the 90s, 90% 90 of all prayer requests are, go to any church that prints up prayer requests in a bulletin and hands it out. And you know what 90% of them are about? Health issues. Medical issues, health issues. That's what they're all about. In the normal church, we'd be, praying, we'd be saying, pray, pray for Doc. That God will open up his blood vessels. Well, I guess for Bob, we should have prayed that God took eight inches of his, you know, intestine out. That'd be nice. It would be nice. Now, I, you know, I opened up that can of worms, so let me say this. God has something better he's offering you. There's something better. Something better for Bob than God going, poof, you don't have problems anymore. You say, what could be better than that? That's an education issue. Your father has to show this to you so that you think like he thinks. Because you know what the wisdom of this world says. The absolute best thing, the thing that would bring God the most glory, is for God to just look at Bob and go, bam, you're healed. And your father doesn't think that. That's not what he thinks. And we don't understand that. And do you know why? Because we don't think like he thinks. He's got to educate you in that. But when you see it, you'll say, you know what? This that he is doing brings him far more glory than 10,000 instant healings ever could. Far more glory. And guess what? It's going to work an eternal weight of glory for you that just getting healed never could. There's something that works two ways there. One of them goes to you and the other one goes to our Father. And believe me, he is vitally interested. And when, and when he says it's a more excellent way, we want to scratch our heads and go, how does it get any better than that? Because all we know is the old Israel program. That's how. Because we don't understand grace. We don't, I mean, we understand some things about it, but we don't understand how does all that work. But you will. See, I did it again. I kind of talked about stuff out there, and I feel like I led you over the cliff, and we're not going to be able to solution it. But, but you, I think you, you've seen me do this enough that you know to go to sleep when I'm doing this. Okay, all right. All right. But you're going to have liberty to make decisions on your own. That's a really big deal because as I have already taught you, under the law, Israel had no liberty to make decisions on their own. If a guy had a question, he didn't just make a decision. He took it to the head of his tribe. If he couldn't answer it, that went to a tribal council. If he couldn't answer it, it went to another higher council for the whole nation. And then, and then finally, it could go to the high priest. And he would pull out and that would tell him what God's will was. But the one thing is for certain is he could never make that decision on his own. They did not have that kind of liberty. You, however, are going to be given the kind of liberty that is unbelievable. And your father is going to trust you with that. 
And as I got off on a while ago, a pastor in the dispensation of grace has no right to try to tell you what the will of God is. I, I, I'm forbidden to try to control you and to dictate what you're supposed to do. But sadly, that's how most folks actually get along in their spiritual life in these days. Okay, now, there's, I, I want to just see this. Let me just look ahead at this next verse here. I don't know if I have it on the PowerPoint. Let me look. I do. So here's the primary liberties that you're going to have as an adult son. The first one is freedom from fear motivation. And that's a big one. Remember that Romans 8, 14 and 15? For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to what? Fear. Uh, there was two words. He calls it a spirit of bondage. What was the Galatians? You might remember when we, the first passage we went to in Galatians, he talked about, I don't have my notes in front of me. I could back up. Here it is. Uh, no, 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 no. Yeah, entangled again with the yoke. Don't get entangled again with the yoke of bondage. You see that? And that's what the law was. It was a yoke of bondage. And he's saying, you know what? You guys came out from under the law and you got saved by grace. Don't go back. Don't get tangled up in that yoke of bondage again because that thing is going to cause you all kinds of problems. And, and indeed, it was already doing that for the Galatians. What was that thing doing? And I, I don't, I, again, I don't think I put it in here, did I? No, I didn't. So let me, let me just tell you. That, what you tell me, because you know, what are some of the bondages that the law put us under? Puts anyone under. What does the law do? Okay, but I'm, even today, if you try to utilize the law to live for God... It's going to bring you into a bondage. What, in, in what way? What will it do that's bad? Well, it'll confuse you. What else? Okay, it does. It shows you what a sinner you are. That's, and, and that's basically all it does, isn't it? But, but, but it has another thing. What, what else does it do? It condemns you. It, it, it does. It, it, it binds you and limits you. Remember, it gives sin dominion, and it causes sin to be exceeding sin. Remember all those things we talked about? These are the things that you get bound up in. And by the way, if you're under the law, how much decision-making liberty do you have? None. You, it, it binds you up. I know you were saying the same thing. It binds you up in every way imaginable. And so he says, don't get tangled up in that. And, 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 and have that liberty. And so it's called a, a yoke of bondage. In Romans, he calls it a spirit of bondage. And, and because we were talking about fear, there's some verses that I wanted to give you on that. And here we go. Leviticus 25, 17. This is how Israel was told to think while they were under the law. Okay, look. Let me black it out. Let, let me set it up for you. One of the big riddles for scholars is how in the world do you justify that angry God of the Old Testament with the loving, sweet-tempered God of the New Testament? That's always been the riddle. And they talk about it in college, you know, and they have these discussions, and, 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 and they even go so far as to say that there's something really wrong with that Old Testament God. He's just quick to throw down wrath. He's capricious. He's mad at the drop of a hat. He doesn't, he's not long-suffering. He's not merciful. And, 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 and oh, he's just terrible. And that doctrine at a point in our history was actually the prevalent doctrine. And it made everybody think about God that way. But then when someone went over to the New Testament and found verses over there, they began to say, but wait, here's this God of the New Testament. And the, and the preachers switched. They, they used to preach, God is mad at all of you. That's how they used to preach. Then when, when, when that switched, they began to say, 
God is not mad at you anymore. He was last year. Now we've decided now he's okay. Now he's just going to be merciful. And that pendulum just goes back and forth through church history. Well, let me tell you, the, one of the reasons they're noticing a difference is because in the Old Testament, they're reading about how God is dealing with a nation who put themselves under a law and contracted for blessings and curses. And then they read over here in Paul's epistles about grace and not being under the law, and they're trying to make those two fit together. And they have no concept of rightly dividing the word, so they can't, they can't get it right. All right, now, with... It was. Well, sure it was. It, it was a religious, political... It was. All right. So, here's what he says, Leviticus 25, 17. You shall not therefore oppress one another... But thou shalt fear thy God, for I am the Lord your God. How would you like to get up with that every morning? You're going to fear me because I'm the Lord. What kind of impression do you get from that? This austere, hot-tempered God, short on, you know, on patience. Let's look at the next one. Leviticus 26:14. But if you will not hearken unto me and will not do all these commandments, and if you shall despise my statutes, or if your soul abhor my judgments so that you will not do all my commandments, but that you break my covenant, I also will do this unto you. I will even appoint over you terror consumption and the burning egg that shall consume the eyes and cause sorrow of heart and you'll sow your seed in vain and your enemies will eat it. What does that sound like? I can't make this guy mad. I gotta stay on his good side. Here's the next one. Deuteronomy 4.10. Especially the day that thou stoodest before the Lord thy God in Horeb, when the Lord said unto me, Gather me the people together, and I will make them hear my words, that they may learn to fear me all the days that they shall live upon the earth, and that they may teach their children. Teach their children what? Be afraid of him. Now that... But see, and preachers, you know what's really, what's really a load of fun? Is watch a guy that doesn't know how to rightly divide the word try to take these verses back here in the Old Testament and convince you that that's really not what he's saying. Now that's a load of fun to watch a guy do that. Deuteronomy 6.2 that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God, to keep all his statutes and commandments which I command thee, thou, thy son, thy son's son, all the days of thy life, that thy days may be prolonged. Does anybody know what happens to your days if you don't? That's right, they get shortened. Did that happen with Israel? And you know what? How many times have I heard in my life someone in the dispensation of grace quoting that commandment with promise to honor thy father and thy mother that thy days may be long upon the earth. And they say, I honor my father and mother so I can live a long life. Let me ask you a question. The dispensation of grace, everybody honor their father and mother, live a long life? You know better. So now, if, you look, if you're a scholar and you look at that, you have to say, well, see, that's why we know the Bible's not literally true, because, see, that actually doesn't work. I can give you some examples. And, what, and, and his problem, the problem is that the Bible isn't true. The problem is he doesn't know how to rightly divide the word. He's using an Old Testament scripture for Israel under the law, and he's trying to make it work in the dispensation of grace for the church, the body of Christ. He has no clue what's going on. And you know what's really crazy? People pay him money to do that. Woo! What a country. Here's the next one. Deuteronomy 6.13. That thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and serve him and shall swear by his name. Deuteronomy 6.24. And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes to fear the Lord our God for our good always that he might preserve us alive as it is this day. Deuteronomy 8.6. Therefore thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways and to fear him. 
Deuteronomy 10, 12. And now, Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee but to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, and serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and all thy soul? Deuteronomy 10, 20, Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God. Him shalt thou serve, and to him shalt thou cleave and swear by his name. 13, 4, You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice and serve him and cleave unto him. Hebrews 10, 20, Oh, but I didn't give you that one yet. Sorry. I realize where I am. I, only, I gave you a number of them, but listen, it's by no... Do you, do you know how many of these there are in your Old Testament? Oh, man. Every time they're turning around, God is saying, fear me because I am the Lord. Fear me so that your days can be prolonged. Fear me so that I don't have to bring this terror upon you. Fear me. Now you're an adopted son. You're in, you're, you got it by grace. He's dealing with you not as a child under that law. Now he's dealing with you as an adopted son. And guess what he's going to say now? You have liberty. And does he threaten you now? No. He does not. And someone says, well, I, I think we're supposed to have a healthy dose of fear because that's not the relationship. You know what the relationship is? Father to son. It is an intimate relationship. Not based on fear, but based on love. It's something altogether different. I will give you this last verse in Hebrews because this is what happened to people that did not obey that law. If you stepped out of line, you got punished, and here it is. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. You know how they killed him? They stoned him. Not every time, but you know how many times people were stoned? They dig a hole, and they put you in it, up to here and then they cover that hole back in and there you are and then the people stand back and the person that either a, you have wronged or offended in the case of an adulterous woman her husband would throw the first stone and then her children would follow and throw stones and then or if it wasn't that kind of a case, or it was something, but if it deserved the death penalty, and that's why, because, you know, I used to think, why didn't he just dodge, you know? Well, you know, when you're planted in the ground, you're just a target, is all that is. And that's a pretty gruesome thing. I, you can, you can, it doesn't take much imagination to know that uh, that's, a, that's a pretty terrible way it's a pretty terrible way to die. There are people in our society today that say the death penalty does not deter anyone. That is baloney. Rick Davis told me last Tuesday night, he said, I know it deters two people. I said, okay, I'll bite. Who is it? He said, first, them, because you put them to death, they are deterred. That's the end of that. He said, and the second one is me. He said, I don't know about anybody else, but I know two of them that are deterred by the death penalty. The guy that got it and me. I said, well, make it three because it deters me too. Because there are people I would love to shoot, but I can't because I get the death penalty. <laughs> Actually, that was Rick's line. I stole it. <laughs> but Rick would like to shoot everybody. He's going to love that when I <laughs> gets on the tape, isn't it? <laughs> okay, so... They died without mercy under two or three witnesses if they despise the law. But the motivation that we have for living for God is not out of the blessings or curses of the law, but rather it's out of love and appreciation for what God has done for us by his grace. And if you're not motivated by grace, then God isn't the one motivating you. You're being motivated from something else. Okay, let's get to that second one. The next primary liberty that you have as an adult son is that you have freedom from the rudiments of the world. Now, I want to talk, I'm going to give you a couple of verses about this. So here they are, Galatians 4.1. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all, 
but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. That's another phrase that is being used to describe what? It is. That's another phrase that's being used to describe the, the, the law, the elements of the world. Here's the next one, Colossians 2.8. I'm sorry, 2.9. I'm going to finish this. I, I, I want to finish this. We're in bondage under the elements of the world. Verse 9. But now, after that you have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements that he just told you about, wherein to you desire to, again to be in bondage? What's he talking about? He's talking about the elements of this world is a phrase that means something that, you're, that you know points you back to the law. Now look at the Colossians 2.8 passage. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why? As though living in the world are you subject to, now look at this list, ordinances, touch not, taste not, handle not, which all are to perish with the using after the commandments and doctrines of men, which things have indeed a show of wisdom in will worship and humility and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. He says, you know, th there's this... There's this false worship that's going on. It makes, your, makes you look good. It makes you look like you're really putting the flesh down, you know, and all this stuff. When he says, you're subject to ordinances. Well, where do the, what are those ordinances? Where do those come from? They come from the law. Look at this next phrase in parentheses. Touch not, taste not, handle not. Were they ever told in Israel's program, touch not? Yeah. How about taste not? Handle not. You'd be unclean. See, there was something you had to do if you did that. He said, which are all to perish with the you. Why are you going back under that? That's why he says, if you're dead from the rudiments of the world, why are you doing this? Now, why does he call it the rudiments of the world? Because those things were the rudimentary teaching aids that showed the shadow of the real. For instance, Israel was told those male children would be circumcised on the eighth day. Physical circumcision. Anything magic about that? No. Do you know what that was a picture of? The spiritual circumcision that comes with the new covenant for them. And Paul talks about that circumcision that is not made with hands. That was just the shadow of the real. When, 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 they, when they observed all of those things, you know what those observances were? They were a picture of something else that was yet to come that was the substance. This was just the pic, this was the shadow, that's the sun, this is the picture, that's the real thing. Under grace, folks, you've been given the real thing. Why do you want to go back and fool with the types? You say, oh, we're, we're, in our church, we're going to celebrate the Day of Atonement. And we're going to have a guy dress up like the high priest. And he's going to show you what happened on the Day of Atonement. I'll tell you about my Day of Atonement. I was eight years old. I trusted Jesus Christ to be my all-sufficient Savior. And guess what? That high priest, who's under a tutor and governor, by the way, that high priest had to keep going in year after year after year after year on the Day of Atonement because those sacrifices and the blood of bulls and goats, Hebrews says, could never take away sin. You know what it was? It was a type waiting for the real. We honor that junk like, oh, look how spiritual we are. And your children, you're just kids, ignorant kids. Because you walk around acting like it's something and God looks at it and says, that's the one thing my son died to deliver you from. 
Get out of that! You've got the real thing. You've got the real thing. Why do you want to go back and, and let's revel in and rehearse an inadequate substitute that had to be kept being done? I'm not mad at y'all. I'm just saying I just realized what I'm doing here. But what, I mean, it's frustrating to me because, you know, that, that's where the church is today. We're reveling in the shadows and making much about the types. And you've been given the real. Any kid that got his driver's license that still plays with his toy car and, and doesn't really want to get behind the wheel isn't ready for adulthood. He's still a child. Okay. I'm over it. Third, liberty. You're free from fear motivation. You don't serve God out of fear. You're free from the rudiments of the world. And you're free from governorship and limited decision making. And if there's one of these three that is the hallmark, it's this third one. That you are now going to have the ability to make decisions on your own. Now, these are three of the main, they're not all, but they're the three main liberties I want to make you aware of right here at the start. But to end the session, I want to tell you that there is one other important issue in being treated as a son. But to understand this issue, we are going to have to take some time, a few minutes, which I don't have because they're blinking me, we're going to have to go back into Israel's program and see something because you've been given liberty from this. So what we'll do is we'll reserve that until the start of the next session because I do want you to understand the great liberty that you've been given as an adopted son and daughter of your heavenly father. And this is one that's very important. This is one that, by the way, Israel could not put on display. They absolutely could not. And you are called to do it. So that's why I want you to see it. So anyway, that's how we'll start out the session next time. And then we'll continue to go through the...